Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I'd like to welcome you to our Ubiquity Wisdom School Great Books Seminar, where every month we take on a book that has had a major impact on human culture and human lives. And uh, we each year have uh, one or two guest lecturers uh, to amplify what uh, Georgie Zabo and I um, uh, create for the students with our notion of great books. And we're very pleased today to have uh, Carolyn Mace, who's a very old friend and, and colleague who's taught uh, many courses that uh, through the Wisdom School and obviously through CMED, and probably most of you have taken her CMED courses, so she's not someone who needs uh, a long introduction to this group. And we ask people uh, to comment on the book that they consider either a favorite book or a book that's had uh, a major impact on them. And much to my delight and surprise when I asked Carolyn, I was thinking that Carolyn being a scholar and a theologian would have uh, in mind some great theological tome. But no, it's Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> and so uh, we are all very uh, eager, uh, Dr. Mace, to hear your, your uh, <laughs> words of wisdom about what is considered one of the most extraordinary works of literature in the English language, and which since its publication in 1865 uh, has never been out of print and has been uh, published in over 97 different languages. So, Carolyn, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Before I begin my uh, official lecture, I have to just say, um, these are the ways of Wonderland. So, <clears throat> according to Lewis Carroll, learn not to make personal remarks. It's very rude. Take care of the sense and the sounds will take care of themselves. Fight till six and then have dinner. <laughs> Keep your temper. Don't grunt. That's not at all proper, a proper way of expressing yourself. And now I'm going to explain to you why I have a passionate love of Alice in Wonderland. First of all, I love the power of words. And Lewis Carroll is a genius with the power of words. And um, I chose Alice. I have, let me just say, I am a longtime Alice lover, um, a passionate lover of Alice in Wonderland. My house even has a painted rabbit hole. Um, the the uh, walk down to my basement is actually painted like a rabbit hole. And then when you get to my basement, one of the walls has a tea party painted on it. And um, I have, I don't know, 12 to 15 copies of Alice in Wonderland, one actually signed by Alice Liddell Hargrove, who is the Alice that Lewis Carroll based Alice in Wonderland on. And so Alice is a living force in my life and for numerous reasons. The first being that the power of the language Lewis Carroll uses, which is something I'm going to emphasize. Um, and, and the reason is I'm going to go into the door of Alice through myth, through archetypes, and through health. That's several doors, but I can go into all kinds of doors because I'm talking about Alice. But, you know, one even the other day, I was reading the newspaper, I think the Daily Beast, and the, one of the writers said Giuliani had fallen down a rabbit hole. I mean, Alice, her metaphors, her, the language of Lewis Carroll is used constantly. And how many times have we said, have you said, I'm down a rabbit hole, or used a phrase from Alice all the time? I have some references I'm going to share with you later today, later this morning that are frequently referred to, but the people that Alice has inspired among them, John Lennon and some of his work. 
But the reason I, I thought of Alice for this class is actually has to do with one of the jewels I want to give to you. And that is the power of absurdity and the power of your words and the capacity to reframe your reality through imagination, through enchantment, and through absurdity that um, helps you to break through the barrier of reason. Now, um, so I'm gonna hit a pause button on Alice for a moment and come through why I think that's so important. And that's that in my experience as a uh, someone who's dealt with um, health and healing and the struggles that we have in um, our everyday life with life itself what and and with coping with the struggles of life why things happen as they do um, how do I get through this um, how do I heal that one of the books I wrote was why people do not heal so that question has been with me a very long time. And I've looked at numerous reasons for, you know, why, why do people fear healing? Um, why is that difficult for them? <coughs> Excuse me. And I've walked through that for a long time. And it's progressed through what has eventually led me into um, mysticism and the mystical reasons for that. And that has led me into the deeply, profoundly creative nature of the soul. And the tools the soul relies upon through which we indeed influence the creation of our reality and utilize the um, cooperate with the laws of the universe. The tool, the greatest tools that we have been given is our capacity to select the words that we use to frame the experiences that we have. The capacity to be within an experience and to decide whether this experience is a nightmare, an opportunity, a curiosity, a gift, or a disaster. Every single word we use is a universe unto itself that then connects to, it's like they're like flying carpets that we set ourselves upon that then open up how that experience will unfold within our lives and how that experience will then um, unfold within our biology will unfold within the next language the next word that we choose within our within our uh, psychic field and it will create the next phase the next stage of our reality itself when i talk to people one-on-one -on -one about how they frame their memories, how they then chart their next stage, how they make decisions, how they um, organize their challenges. It's been my experience again and again and again that people lock themselves into familiar vocabulary. Um, and that the vocabulary is from what I would call the lower realm the vocabulary that has a lot to do with the vocabulary of what I would call pol the polarity world. They were wronged or they were uh, the victim, the victim, it's the power of the outside world versus them. The, um, the prob it's something is a, a problem, therefore there is one solution. Something was bad or good, something was right or wrong something was unjust and, and unfair and something it's it's always the language of polarity and when you are in the cycle of polarity 
You can't, it's impossible to get off that hamster wheel and to engage the vocabulary essential to healing. What I realized is that the, one of the greatest blockages, if not the greatest to healing, is that a person lacks the vocabulary essential to make the transition to a higher altitude of perception. That even, I mean, one of the great moments in the movie, The Dead Poet Society, is when the professor, I think it was Robin Williams, tells his students to stand on desks just to see the world, just to see the classroom from a different perspective. And, and that for them was just this great moment of aha, just, just to get two feet higher in a classroom. That's what vocabulary does. And for me, that's what Alice is. Alice is the, the, the idea of enchantment. The word enchantment, I never hear that used. I never hear people say that an experience for them was enchanting. And, and as I say to people, one of the exercises I give people, and I'm going to give it to you, is to rewrite an experience that you are in with Alice's vocabulary. As if you were experiencing something that for you might be so challenging, but what would happen if you wrote that experience from within Wonderland, if it was absolutely that for you. So let me, let me discuss Alice from a different perspective. Alice in Wonderland for me is a, somewhat of a hero's journey. She's, she's, it's a call to adventure. It's wonder, he, I think he called Wonderland at first Adventureland, and then it didn't set well with him, and he eventually called it Wonderland. And he set it underground, which is spectacular, because the underground, it, is, it was actually, when you think of it, that's where, you know, that was a place of, that's where hell is. That's a place of darkness, but it, it was for him the opposite because that is one of Carol's geniuses is that he turned everything upside down. He turned everything the opposite. And there's a story that one author tells about him and that the house that he grew up in was um, he had, I think, 10 brothers and sisters and and unlike a lot of people in the Victorian age, he was born in 1832. And so a lot of people during that time and in the centuries before and certainly years afterwards, uh, it was rare for all the children of a family to survive to childhood. But in, the Car in Carol's family, the Dodsons, Dodgins, D-O-D-G-S-O-N, Dodgins, how do you pronounce that? Dodson, whatever. Um, but the point I wanted to make was what, what Carol noticed in his, the house that he grew up in was that the builders had etched their names in the window, and, but they had done it from the outside. So when he was standing on the inside, their signatures were backwards. They looked in reverse. And that was what eventually became the inspiration for Alice through the looking glass. So, and he loved the idea of seeing things backwards or um, inside out and upside down. Um, Alice was um, one of the, I think perhaps we could think of her as um, this rare example of a young girl, um, of a young girl called to the hero's journey. Most of the um, larger than life heroes are men or boys, but Alice is this innocent girl who goes on this hero's journey uh, in which she's called into this adventure and she has to, what the heck? Is he? God, what is it? 
in which she's called into this adventure and she has to face all of these obstacles and make her way through this tunnel and make her way through all of these characters all by herself and confront all these absurdities and uh, deal with things she's never seen before. She has to change her shape. She's, she, go, she, grow, she is stretched out of all uh, her re familiar reality and she has to cope with all of this all by herself and she has to prove that she's worthy of all these obstacles. She, she meets a queen, a mad queen. She, she goes at one, through one thing after another and she is a, um, and she has to come out the other end and survive this. And <clears throat> she has no idea where she is. She tumbles down this rabbit hole. And <clears throat> from the get-go, <clears throat> she has to grab onto her sanity, such as it is, and even question that. And so this, this is very much kind of an absurd, but very real hero's journey. But Alice is not a God figure, as is typical of the, of, of the mythic hero journeys like Hercules or... Uh, you know, Krishna, uh, uh, she's not that. She's this innocent little non-God figure who's not about soul transformation or of humanity, but one of imagination, of transforming imagination. So she stands in her own vessel um, of inspiration, inspiring a different type of transformation, a transformation of thought, a transformation of, of how you see social structure, of how you see the constraints with, with, uh, about the world around you. And that's one of the, one of the um, uh, reasons I love Alice so much. And, and I, I love that Carol found the restrictions of the Victorian world in which he grew up so very confining. It was a, a world of rules and restrictions and regulations that he found at times um, unbearable. And it, just as an aside, it could be because he had a shadow life, which is not something we need to talk about, but I think that um, he had, as it's rumored or hinted at, an, an unusual um, attraction to, to um, children. Um, I did not find any, in all the things that I have read about him, I've never found an accusation of pedophilia directly. I have found hints of it. Um, and I don't really want to talk about that too much. But he had an unusual, a very unusual attraction to Alice Liddell when she was young, a little girl, and a very unusual attraction to little girls. And um he was never accused of anything that I know of, but that we don't need to go down that road. And only because I, he was, I've never found anything that suggested that. There is, a, there is something I did read by one Oxford scholar on him that suggested that when Alice was older, he approached her father um, and asked to court her. And um, that went nowhere. And after that, they no longer saw each other. So something obviously did happen, but we'll leave it at that. Anyway, um, now let's get on to the archetypal and, and uh, the use of words and onto the greater message of it. Now let me share some things with you because I'm not sure all of you are as familiar with Alice as I am um, or that you have read her again, read the book again. 
but I think I want to put some of this absurdity in your head before I take you down the rabbit hole so that you have some of this fun in your head. And, and let me add this, that um, what I hope to inspire in you and what I would like to actually have you do as a, as a piece of work before we meet again is that I want you to, I have no doubt that at some point in your life you have felt as if you've gone down the rabbit hole or maybe you're in a rabbit hole. And that archetypal experience is one of tumbling out of control into a place you don't know, are unfamiliar with, that you just fall into out of the clear blue. And you lose control and control is a, a position we strive to maintain in our lives. And when we feel that we've lost control of anything, that is one of the most terrifying positions that we can find ourselves in, the loss of control. And um, especially when we find ourselves in circumstances where we actually don't recognize a lot of the world around us, when our world becomes an absurd world. So I just want to put some absurdity in you because here's where when you fall down a rabbit hole it really is an opportunity for all the great mystical teachings to animate themselves in you where it is actually one of the highlights where um the teachings of Buddha, that this world is an illusion, that it's just an illusion. You've held on to something that can evaporate in the blink of an eye. And then you have an experience in which something does evaporate in the blink of an eye. And it's, it's exactly what happens. And when it does, we can't get over that something evaporated in the blink of an eye. And that's a white rabbit encounter. Time, time, I'm running out of time. Where's it? Time, 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 time. And we all have a white rabbit. We'll get to the white rabbit, but that is a white rabbit. When we find that I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. I can't, I can't, what happened to the time? And, and we are all dealing with white rabbit stuff. Time, 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 time. Because, because time, we, our relationship with this thing called time really is shifting, as I'll explain at some point, this week, next week, whatever. Our relationship with time really is changing. We had to create a relationship with time. We actually incarnated a relationship with time. There was a time when time did not exist as we know it. People simply followed the... <clears throat> this, <clears throat> the cycle of the sun and the moon. They didn't have time, the concept of time, a relationship to hour and moment and the significance of time and valuing yourself by time. How much are you worth an hour? Had to be created. And how much passed within that hour and what takes place within eight hours and then eight hours off and then sleeping eight hours, the way we relate to this, all of that is a construct of consciousness. It is something that we created. <clears throat> anyway, I love this. Alice says, um, second thoughts are the best. I have got to be so sure of that, that nearly all my thoughts now are second thoughts. I have no first thoughts as a general rule. <laughs> I mean, really? I mean, isn't that brilliant? Isn't that utterly brilliant? I just, um, 
she has rules and regulations, but I, I won't go into that because it's just, I, 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 I just, now, I am not taking you down the rabbit hole yet. It's just too, it's just too brilliant. Now, this is important and I want you to remember this. For the rest of your life, beware of logic. It is an organized way of going wrong with confidence. <laughs> Tell me that's not brilliant. Tell me that's utterly not brilliant. Now, here's another one. Tell me there's not wisdom in this. Dear, dear, how queer everything is today. And yesterday things went on just as usual. I wonder if I've changed in the night. Let me think. Was I the same when I got up this morning? I almost think I can remember feeling a little different. But if I'm not the same, the next question is, who in the world am I? Ah, that's the puzzle. Isn't that brilliant? Because you aren't the same in the morning. You aren't the same. And everything does change in the night. Everything does. You are not the same in the morning. And here's a little jewel of truth. You are never the same in the morning. And you do change during the night. And if you expect to get up and be the same in the morning, you are kidding yourself. Nothing is the same. You actually do wake up in a brand new universe every morning. And everything is totally different. Now, I wanted to read an, uh, something about uh, John Lennon, and then we're going down the rabbit hole. This is Lucy in the Sky. And during an interview with Playboy, <clears throat> they asked him, where did Lucy in the Sky come from? And he said, my son Julian came in one day with a picture he painted about a school friend of his named Lucy. He'd sketched in some stars in the sky and called it Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Simple. The other images in the song weren't drug inspired. He said the images were from Alice in Wonderland. It was Alice in the boat. She's buying an egg and it turns into a sheep and the next moment they're rowing in a boat somewhere and I was visualizing that. So John Lennon said, let me repeat that for everybody. He said the other images in the song weren't drug inspired and, and Lennon says, the images were from Alice in Wonderland. It was Alice in the boat. She's buying an egg and it turns into a sheep and the next minute they're rowing in a, a rowboat somewhere and I was visualizing that. And then let in this. Were you able to find other, others to share your visions with? And he said, only dead people in books. Lewis Carroll, certainly. He said, what about the walrus? He said, it's from the walrus and the carpenter in Alice in Wonderland. To me, it was a beautiful poem. It never dawned on me that Lewis Carroll was commenting on the capitalist and social system. I never went into that bit about what he really meant like people are doing with the Beatles work. Later, I went back and looked at it and realized that the walrus was the bad guy and the carpenter was a good guy. And I thought, oh, blah, I picked the wrong guy. I should have said, I am the carpenter. But that wouldn't have been the same now, would it? You see, um, Lewis Carroll was always weaving in two in layers of meaning. He was a satirist. He was a humorist. But everything had a kind of double meaning for him. He was always, always um, communicating something. Here, I beg your pardon, said Alice. It isn't respectable to beg said the king. It isn't respectable to beg. And that is a life lesson. It isn't, is it? It's never respectable. Okay, so down the rabbit hole we go. Let me talk about the rabbit hole for a second and falling into the underworld. And what... Um, what I want you to be aware of. I don't, I don't know any of you, I can't see any of you, and I don't know what, you're, what you are confronting in your lives. I don't know what your situations are. 
So you have to do that work as I'm speaking. So I'm gonna put the ball in your court right now. And I'm gonna ask you in order to appreciate or make a class come alive, especially one online, I have to trust that there's some part of you that's um, actively weaving itself into the words that I'm saying. And one way for me to, 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 to communicate that, to feel that attachment to you, is to ask you to do things along the way. And um, I know because of the nature of the human journey that there has to be something in your life that you are facing or confronting some challenge, some obstacle, some force that is weighing um, against maybe some life decision or maybe you're trying to heal something. Um, that's just the nature of life. And that means that there's some way that you talk to yourself about that, which means that you've chosen a type of vocabulary within which you have um, um, framed that you've given it a reality you've you've chosen words to describe that challenge that that challenge that illness that obstacle you've chosen particular words to lock in that reality for you and so it's important at before we begin our adventure in wonderland that you identify at least three to five words that are the way you would describe that problem or that challenge to somebody if you met them for the first time and you wanted to describe it and you were to sit to share that with someone what are these hardcore words that you use? Do you say, I have a problem? If you, so if problem would be one of the words that you use, would you say that uh, this is a challenge? Would you, would you use the phrase that you don't know what to do so that you don't, so don't is a word that you would choose. These, these words are low, what I think of as lower realm words in that they tend to be, um, words of hardcore matter that that say that 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 you're pushing against forces that instead of fluid words that are inspiring enchanting now i realize if you said to me how in the world would you say that a an illness is enchanting no i get that but we'll get to that in a minute well maybe next i don't know when but we'll get to that and um and it's not that the illness is enchanting, but healing can be. Healing can be. So um, I, I need you to take a look at how you frame a circumstance or how you frame, maybe you're going through a divorce, maybe you have a financial crisis, whatever it is. How... Can you go, look, I... I work from home and this is like mission control here. And I, yeah, yeah. I'm expecting medicine. Just. No, we're good. Sorry guys. I'm expecting medication for my dog who's very, very, very sick. So. Sorry, guys. I thought it was coming this afternoon, and it is. Forgive me. Um, my dog is very sick. Okay. So back to your language. Um, just do pick these words and focus on them. And if through this class you can find a way to release these words and frame your circumstances with a very different vocabulary 
to see what that can do for you as you move through a, a, a circumstance. What I actually have learned and deeply believe is that the power of words is so incredible that they are magnets through which we create reality. They are so powerful that um, by shifting the word that we use, even from, from I don't know what to do to what a curious situation, even the use of the word curiosity brings inspiration versus saying, I just don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. Whereas thinking, this is very curious. I'm, I'm in wonder. That, that state of consciousness is one that brings about a totally different field of inspiration. <sighs> Got it? So just take a minute to think about the language that you use when you are up against something in your life that and how you see it okay now tumbling down the rabbit hole alice has thoughts on her way down the rabbit hole and um so do all of us when we lose control when we find ourselves in a circumstance, we all have thoughts and we frame those thoughts. This, these are Alice's. After such a fall of this, as this, I shall think nothing of tumbling, <laughs> of tumbling downstairs. How brave they'll all think of me at home. I wonder what latitude or longitude I've got to. I wonder if I shall fall right through the earth. How funny it'll all seem to come out among the people that walk with their heads downwards. Do cats eat bats? Do bats eat cats? This, these are her thoughts down the rabbit hole. She starts reversing things. Do cats eat bats? Do bats eat cats? She's falling down and she's reversing things. So let's think, I mean, think about that for a second. Think about that. This is the nature of God. Why do moments, why do experiences of extraordinary change, extraordinary change, rapid change, what we would think of as chaotic change happen? Now hold that thought and let me take you into an Alice world. What's a miracle? What's a miracle? A miracle is something that happens out of the realm of ordinary time. That's what makes it a miracle. It happens out of ordinary time and space when God, the divine, bends the laws of, the, of ordinary laws of nature just for you. So that's an experience happens in mystical time instead of scientific time, instead of the laws of ordinary science. The Lord, it, it happens in Kairos time instead of Kronos time. Chaos is somewhat the same thing in that something happens in timelessness instead of ordinary time. It's the same principle, but applied to chaos instead of a miracle. Something happens in timelessness. Time is taken out of something. Um, your body changes in an accident is the reverse of a miracle. It's that all of a sudden you go from being able to walk to not walk in a blink of a second. Being able to not walk to walk is a miracle. Being able to walk to not walk is an accident. Being able, do you see? It's the, the same thing, only the mirror image of it. And, and one is we see the results, we see how that can happen. You just got hit by a car and you broke your leg and now you can't walk. But the other side of it is you can't walk because you, your back is broken and now you can walk and it happens in, in timelessness as well. But that's unexplainable. One, you can, you can't. But chaos going down the rabbit hole 
getting to that stage, we don't see the hand of God at all because the result is not something we can cope with. And yet, here's something I realized. In my work with healing, I've witnessed miracles in some of my, my um, workshops on healing. I've witnessed them. In, I, I um, have had the experience of some people um, actually healing instantly in my class. Others have written and said that the one woman said she came to my workshop because she had a terminal brain tumor and six weeks later it was gone. Now, I do not credit me. Let me be very, very clear. But I do credit grace. Yes, indeed I do. And prayer. Yes, indeed I do. But it, and it did set me on a passion to wonder how miracles happen. How do they happen? To whom? What is the, the um, mechanism? Not that anyone could ever explain, by the way, the mechanism of God, but this much I have come to believe. And that's that um, I don't think heaven is selfish with miracles at all. What I do think, however, is that we are all, we share something these days that is a, an interesting characteristic of our time that has not been a characteristic of humanity prior to this time. And that's that we have this incredible craving to develop the inner self and self-esteem. We have this sense that we are incredibly significant. Everything we say, everything we do, everything we feel has to be listened to, processed, heard, whatever, recognized. None of which is true. That's all an illusion. But what is not an illusion, we, we, we have this appetite for self-discovery because what it really is, is this calling to discover the power of our soul. That everything we say, every word we say, is actually an act of creation. That's what's going on. And, and if the ego in us is the carrot that drives us inside, so be it. So be it. That's the draw. That's the magnet that we have to go through. And the stage that we go through is this, it takes an extraordinary amount of interior self, extraordinary amount of interior self to be able to withstand an experience that you cannot validate. In, in the development of yourself, in the development of self-esteem, in the development of being able to fall down a rabbit hole of extraordinary proportion, not an ordinary rabbit hole of chaos, but what if you were directed to a rabbit hole by heaven? What if, one, what if you didn't fall down a rabbit hole just out of chaos of your own making, careless choice, but what if heaven sent you down a rabbit hole because your reality had to be changed because it was time. It was time. It's a mystical rabbit hole. The amount of self-esteem you have to have to withstand an experience in a reality that you cannot validate, you can't prove, you you where and that is what a miracle is to have a healing that can't be proven by science that 
and you have people come up, think about how much validation people need. Think of how much validation you might need for even the slightest emotional. Someone goes, and you have to process it for three years. That your self-esteem is still that fragile. You don't have the kind of self-esteem that is required to sustain the profound experience of being given a, an experience that no one else will ever have, that you cannot prove. You cannot prove to the, you've been to the wonderland you've been to. You cannot, you have no evidence of it, and yet it's changed you, it's transformed you, it's given you a different perspective that you are now meant to take into the world. And the world is going to come at you like a tsunami with its doubt. Perhaps you've been given a vision. A vision is wonderland. It's wonderland. It is a rabbit hole. Absolutely a rabbit hole. A vision to perhaps start a university. That's a rabbit hole. You've been given a, a vision to, I don't know, go and help orphans. Who knows what? That's a rabbit hole that you fall down. And there's nobody down there in a vision. There's no one but you. No one but you. And you come out and you have no way, no way. There is no way that you can prove you've had this vision. No way. There's, it's impossible. So you have only yourself to sustain. And someone says, comes at you, like in a miracle healing, and says, we don't even believe you were sick in the first place. Maybe the doctors were wrong. Maybe they were all wrong. And the amount of self-belief that you have to have in yourself is titanium in strength. That's number one. And number two, the amount of inner strength you need to have to, to sustain the impact of having your world shift at the speed of a rabbit hole. Time, 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 says the rabbit, is incredible because most people cannot heal at the speed of light because they can't bear the speed of light. They can't bear it. They can't go from having been dependent and the world of dependency and the vocabulary of dependency and what it means to be helpless. And they don't, they want the pain to go. Indeed they do, but they don't want to release the, priv the vocabulary of it and the relationship of dependency and shift into the power of independency. Just like that, just like that. It's too fast, too fast a to transition, too fast. That's why I love the rabbit hole. That's why I love to think of the rabbit hole as this extraordinary experience from a mystical point of view, from a mystical. That chaos is in fact this experience of utter transformation at the speed of light that is no different in fact than a miracle, except that it's done at the earth level where you can actually experience all of it and yet present. It's, an, it's absolute chaos that you can see. And it depends on how you frame it. It depends totally on how you frame it. That you, how you make your way through this experience and how you frame it that determines how the journey in Wonderland, whether it is Wonderland or the underworld. I, I would like to open for questions right now, actually, before I continue to, um, I have so much more, but I think this is actually, um, um, except one other thing, if I could end on this. Uh, before we go, because um, one of the characters I want you to, and I want to, wait, I'm not done. I, I think I'm done, but I'm never done. The, 
I love the queen. You know, you're going to meet the queen. I'm going to give you a cast of characters to deal with. When you're in your underground, put this down, put down the queen. This is one of my favorite, favorite encounters of Alice. And she meets the queen and the queen says, and Alice says to her, there's no use trying. Alice said, one can't believe impossible things. And the queen says, I dare say you haven't had much practice. When I was your age, I always did it for a half hour a day. Where sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Now that's your homework assignment. You need to believe six impossible things before breakfast. That's your homework assignment. To think of six impossible things that you absolutely told yourself are not possible before breakfast, every day before we meet again. Absolutely, absurdly impossible things in your life. You thought, I could never, I could never be an artist. Yeah, why? Because it's absurdly impossible. Yeah, think of how you've restricted your life. No one will ever love me. That's impossible. Put it down. I, you are to put down all the things you say are totally, totally impossible. That's your Alice assignment. And that is totally your Alice assignment because now we're going down the rabbit hole. So Wonderland or the Underground, which one is it going to be for you? Wonderland or the Underground? That's your homework assignment. Yep, 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 yep. It's so good. Can I read one last thing? Is it okay? Please. Please. I, I love this. Oh my God. This is the Duchess's morals. Everything's got a moral, if only you can find it. Flamingos and mustards and mustard both bite. Flamingos and mustard both bite. And the moral of that is birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> The more there is of mine, the less there is of yours. Oh, tis love, tis love that makes the world go round. Be what you would seem to be. Or, if you'd like it put more simply, never imagine yourself to be otherwise than what it might appear to others that what you were or might have been was not otherwise than what you have, than what you had been would have appeared to them to be otherwise. Do you want me to read that again? Because it's so wild. Never imagine yourself not to be otherwise than what it might appear to others that what you were or might have been was not otherwise than what you had been would have appeared to them to be otherwise. If everybody minded their own business, the world would go round a deal faster than it does. Okay, that's him. That's my Alice wisdom for this morning. Questions? <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you so, so, so much. You brought that book uh, very much alive. Let's start uh, with Georgie. And then uh, the students, you know the drill, raise your hands and I'll recognize you after Georgie finishes and uh, we'll go for probably for another half hour and then we'll close it off. Uh, but Georgie, why don't you start? Thank you, thank you, thank you. I loved it. I, <laughs> I loved it so much. You are a master lecturer. You, I, I was smiling at the beginning and then it was all serious and then it, we were smiling at the end as well. Wow. Well, okay, I have, I have a few comments. I need to segment them. Either it's on the book and, and, and your mastery. Um, thank you for sharing your perspective on this wonderful book. For whatever reason, this book didn't leave a huge mark on my psyche. For me, The Little Prince, and Exuberis Prince, was much more of significant. I don't know why, but nevertheless. Um, the last few days when I was reading some comments uh, on this book, I said to myself, no, I'm just going to leave it. I don't want to be influenced by others' take on this because this is just, this is art. And art means it's so subjective. Do we need, do we care about what the, the author, the, the creator actually said or meant about that art? Or it's, it's about us, how we interpret it. And I loved your interpretation. I loved how you infused Buddhism and imagination and the nature of God and, let me get my notes, miracles and, sociology and um 
this book apparently belongs to the genre of nonsense, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's apparently, it is, it is so apparently, but this, you know, child, childhood stories makes nonsense to the adults, but makes sense to the kids. So I was thinking that why it is so important as adults to read kids' books, because we really need to go back what it was like to be childlike because we lost being in that, in that dimension that yes, a rabbit can be dressed and crazy and so forth. And isn't, I, I think that's so true. Also, what you said about call to adventure. Kids are so much more adventurous than we adults, right? So we, we need to learn from children as much as teach them. And then what I loved your, presentation as a whole that through this wonderful piece of art you carried your wisdom through it and to me that meant everything more than Alice and the rabbit hole and whatever the rabbit hole for me actually is going to the unconscious isn't it and finding all the symbolism but I'm sure you will talk about that so thank you so much thank you thank you thank you Back to you, Jim, or... Could, could I say something? Please. Oh, yes. You know, um, I do think in so many ways, um, because adults write children's books, they're, all, they're also, in a sense, written for adults. Um, there is a message hidden in them for adults. And I think the, the message in there's so many hidden messages in um, uh, Alice. Um, like the Queen of Hearts was for Carol uh, a, a blend of, of fury and um, uh, aimless fury and blindness. I mean, he, he wanted to represent characters to the children that alerted them to the false values of society. You know, it's not absurdity. I mean, it's just, he, you know, this was a, an era in which the Victorian values were that children should be kind of seen and not heard in some regard. They were all shuffled by away with governesses. And, and, and he, he saw children as, in, in one lens, one way, but he also thought they were innocent and shouldn't be put away and, and they shouldn't be brought up with these corseted values that of perfection and, and such restricted behavior and that the world was just a place that should be measured by behavior and etiquette. And that, uh, you know, he, he thought that creativity was just uh, so much more. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think, um, I also think in a sense that Lewis Carroll was an art, was a genius that the greater world used. And I think that's what genius is, like Shakespeare, like, um, um, J.K. Rowling, I think that what makes genius is that the archetypal realm gets its hands on you mm -hmm. and plugs into you. And I think that's what makes that when they find someone whose imagination is capable of withstanding the connection to pure virgin light and and and, I, and Lewis Carroll was that, um, and they bring forth a, a message um, that is destined to live on, mm. and, I, and that's Carroll's. And the Little Prince, another one. I think the Little Prince has that same genius to it. There's something in it that's deeper than just. It's not just a story. It's a story that is essential to create, to carry a very rich and profound theme. Mm -hmm.
Mm. Yeah. yeah, so so true. Thank you so much. I, d I do believe that uh, when when we are reading these stories again as adults, yeah, we, we are just reminded of that uh, that core wisdom that children so understand. Yeah. Right? To them, yeah. that is just so natural. But for us, we somehow forgot it, and it's a great, uh, great reminder. And uh, just one more word that uh, just sending healing energies to your dog. So. Oh yeah, my little Abby. Yeah, you know, it's like Alice through the Looking Glass. When I read that, I was so enchanted. I was so enchanted. But what enchanted me was that he reversed everything. He reversed everything. And then I reversed everything. Yeah. I started to reverse everything. And I, I, I swear that that was one of the greatest gifts to my skill. Mm. Was that why couldn't I see the invisible world? Why couldn't I? And I, I, I honestly think Alice was one of the greatest gifts. And, and the whole Alice Wonderland and Alice through the looking glass. One of the greatest assets to my whole life and my career because he said he was like reverse it reverse it just turn it around and I thought why not turn it around why couldn't I see the invisible world he could why couldn't I and then I would reverse what people said did they really mean that or what if they did and it became a game for me when I was a child reversing words what if I reverse this word and it it made me feel like my imagination was toffee. And everything thought, well, if it's not bad, is it good? If it's not down, is it up? And I felt like my my reality became very porous. See? Beautiful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Let's get a few of the students in here. Uh, yeah. Vivian, why don't you go first and then Linda? There we go. Hi, Vivian. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Vivian. Yeah. Hello. So um, I noticed that during your um, your talk that things kept happening, and um, I'm just reminding everybody that Mercury retrograde is in. So anyway, uh, we're now down. We have fun stuff going on, right? Reading about Alice in Wonderland and all the fun stuff that's happening. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I I fell when I was in France on the first day of class for Madonna Rising. And there was, it was just so, um, I've been dealing with it since then with um, several physical issues, but I kind of read this, you know, going down the rabbit hole using that as an example. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I mentioned on the first day of class, I fell on my, I broke, I broke my nose right here. Oh. And uh, yeah, I, I'm going to have to have rotator cuff surgery. So it was really a, a much greater fall. And I had a very, very bad concussion. Oh my and, God. Um, just the, the um, healing circle that I was in was very profound. I have never felt that before. Kaylin Rain was right there, Johnny on the spot, taking, you know, the concussion out, you know, mm -hmm. and it was just beautiful. It, I, so I, you know, I hear you about, you know, reversing things and and you know that it was a very it was a very bad fall i missed the first day of class i felt really bad about it and but you know jim came to see me you know <laughs> at the hotel and i felt very held very much so and I, the second day when i came to class um i mentioned in class that i had lost i'm losing time that's what i said i fell on my third eye and i i you know i, I had a concussion so i felt kind of dreamy anyway but I always have a knack of being able to know what time it is. I've never worn a watch. I, you know, I just know where I'm supposed to be, what time I'm supposed to wake up. And I lost that capability completely. Mm -hmm. And Kaylin says, well, maybe you don't need it anymore. <laughs> I just thought that was great for him. But so anyway, thinking about time. But um, one of the things that I originally came to Ubiquity University for was studying divine intervention for the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, the divine intervention, when you start talking about that, I just went, whoa, that's it. That's what this hall, that's what this falling was about. That's what, 
just trying to change that whole paradigm for myself. And, and um, Georgie knows that I break down crying very easily talking about the climate crisis. And she said, she asked me in my dissertation class, she said, what would a wise woman do? And mm -hmm. this is it. This is it. What a wise woman would do in this situation, if I'm looking for divine intervention, is to change this whole paradigm of the way I'm looking at it. And I appreciate that. And I just wanted to offer that, that that's, that helped me a lot. So I don't have any other, I don't have anything else to say about that, but that's kind of a question. It's like, okay, so how, how do you pursue divine intervention? I guess is my question. How, uh, how do you pursue divine intervention? Yes. Um, well, I, I, you know, I think one of the ways that I could offer um, guidance on that, Vivian, which is a very rich and deep and profound question, is that um, take the word pursuit out. Ah, okay. And as I say, the power of words and substitute the word accept. Accept. How do I accept divine intervention? Accept. Allow divine intervention. Ooh, beautiful. And, and you just have to assume its presence in your life. You don't have to pursue it. You have to allow it. The second thing is that you have to perhaps um, modify what or alter what you think divine intervention looks like. Okay. When we have a passion to change things, we then develop an appetite to um, want to see those changes happen. And we want to see them now and we become impatient. And I think that, um, I think that what this time is about is many, many things. It's like a layer cake. I think that this is the most profound time of change in the history of humanity. That's a big mouthful of words. And I think that this is the emergence of a bio-spiritual, ecological theology, bio-spiritual, e ecological theology where what is emerging is the, it's the end of the Abrahamic religions and the, the half God, half man story and the emergence of a bio-spiritual ecological theology in which we recognize we are one with nature, that the laws of nature are, are the laws that govern our health and they govern the health of the planet. What is in one? is in the whole. What is in the whole is in one. And that whole emerges to the galactic dim dimension. All life breathes together. This is the truth that is, as we heal ourselves, we heal the whole. This living theology, this living bio-spiritual theology mm. is going to eventually somehow filter into the whole. We won't live to see it take over, but we are living to see the disintegration of mythologies that no longer sustain, because what they have in common is the belief that in order to participate, you have to harm the others. And if you have those uh, uh, threads of the Abrahamic religion in you, then what it does to your bio, your own bio-spiritual interior is that you have to maintain a theology that says I am superior to the other and that conflicts with holism you are actually poisoning yourself with that theology oh I agree totally agree so part of what you can do in terms of climate change is that you start living the truth that what is in one is in the whole. You have to live that fully. You have to actually live it fully. What is in one is in the whole, which means, and this is one of the hardest, most challenging things. Every single person you meet is part of the whole. 
they are a molecule of this collective Christos body of, of literally the Christos. And they're not, as difficult as it is, as difficult as it is, and it is ruthlessly difficult. You have to pray your way through these obstacles. I, I think that the, the analogy of the fall to me, and you're, you're absolutely right in the, in the micro for my own life, I think, you know, it's teaching me that, I, you know, I found a physical therapist that's helping me wonder, wonderfully, you know, locally, and that's mm -hmm. the micro. And at the macro level, I think that the wound that we're feeling for, you know, the death of the species and stuff is, is propelling us to, um, to evolve and it's going to be painful, but I, that's, you know, I'm developing that, you know, as I, as I'm, you know, using my own, my own learnings yeah. to help me, to help me get through that. But I appreciate that. And, but it feels like a rabbit hole. It definitely feels like a rabbit hole to me. <laughs> well, all of us are going down the rabbit hole because nobody gives up comfort or power by choice. Nobody. Let me tell you, let me tell you the absurdity of the Maybe energy that I felt from, um, <laughs> from Georgie's class that extinction can be fun. <laughs> Do you remember that, Georgie? It's like, but it was kind of like, you know, we can, we can, we can do these things that will will enrich us and help us. So anyway, thank you, Vivian. Yep. Thank you. We have a number of other hands up here, and uh, only 15 minutes less. But just so people know, we'll Carolyn will be back in December uh, for an additional session on Alice in Wonderland. So if we don't get all the questions. In the next few minutes, then we'll carry on uh, the second Tuesday of December. But let's start with Linda White and then Sean, Shauna, and then Kelly. Let's see if we can at least get three, if not four, uh, questions or comments before we. Uh, you no, know, it can't be the second Tuesday. I'm going to interrupt because that I'm recording that. Do you remember we changed it to later? Yes, we did oh, change yeah. it. That's, That's all right. right. That's in the system. Yes, it is yeah, in the system. Don't, don't scare me. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Linda, thank you, Vivian. I have promoted Linda. She should rejoin as a panelist, but um, has not happened yet. There she is. There we go. Hi, everybody. How are you? Hi, Linda. Caroline, wow. Just wow, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I met you over 30 years ago and have been privileged to watch your journey. And I am auditing this course. And I am going to register as a PhD student because I cannot wait to start writing this paper. Reading this book, I was trying to remember my childhood experiences of it because all I could hear or see was the drug-induced state. You know, that <laughs> honestly, I couldn't get past that. And what you have just brought to this, literally, um, it's such an inspiration of academia from a soul embodied perspective. And as I was listening, you know, I just, I'm just aspiring. And I literally, as recent as Saturday, I just stepped out of the rabbit hole of 10 years. Mm -hmm. And you did a step-by-step -step outline of the journey. And so I'm touched to my core and um, I'm really excited to get it from the inside into words. And um, thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Shauna. Hello. Hi, Shauna. Hi. Um, I do wanted to thank you for an enchanting class. And um, it took me this class to remember my delight with reading Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass as a child. I, I was struggling to connect with that and I really um, appreciate that. I'm very excited to continue on with this book and I just wanted to mention the amazing timing of this book coming into my life, having a just turned 14 year old daughter who's, wow, in such a rabbit hole of transitioning from childhood to adulthood. And this book has helped me because as a mother, that's 
a rabbit hole that you go on with your child, I think, in that transition. And just um, an amazing blessing to me to have this book brought back into my life. And I just thank everyone for their comments and Carolyn for this really delightful class. You're welcome. Thank you for taking it. Kelly. get Kelly up <clears throat> and then Paolo okay hello can you hear me now yes yes I can't hello. see anyone oh you can't see me well let's see video there there we go well thank you for presenting this Carolyn you've been my teacher since the early 90s so um, <laughs> I've been around <laughs> Jesus yeah. I've been around, around too <laughs> I would ask you to comment, um, I'm not sure how to articulate the question, but when I hear time, 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 and your thoughts about words creating our reality, so if you think of time, past, present, future, time, 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 if we reframe our past, is that somehow changing our present and our future? My yes. Experience I'm going to just let you take it from there. You don't need to hear my experience. <laughs> yes, it does. It really does. I mean, um, one of the reasons people feel, oftentimes feel, I mean, if, first of all, even, even all, all the great mystical teachers tell you to stay in the present time. It's just stay in the here and now. And it, and I know from doing readings that what I pick up are your anchors, you know, how you are anchored in the past. And if you could think of that as kind of an isosceles triangle, you're kind of anchored in the past and these anchors are holding on to you. Every time you let go of something, which is often done through an act of forgiveness or release, your um picture it this way your your spirit your soul begins to make its ascension into vertical time versus horizontal and you'll tend to shift your vocabulary along with that and you'll stop speaking in historic terms and you will start speaking in present time acts of synchronicity will will speed up coincidences will speed up you're, you'll, you will become more energized and more energetic. Everything will um, begin to move faster because this is the formula. The more anchors you have, the more attachments, the more sense of, of and the more control issues, the more things you hold on to um, because you think you should have, could have, would have, more resentments you have. Each one of those is a psychic weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, and it costs you active energy that you could be using in a present day enterprise to run your body, to run the laws of energy in your present moment. But instead, you're using that and you're investing it and holding on to a resentment that goes nowhere and it creates nothing. It's like planting seeds on concrete. They produce nothing, but they cost you. They cost you a great deal. And then one day it's psychic weight. And I want you to emphasize W-E-I-G-H-T. But then one day you get it and you, you stop that. And well, let me say that the more weight you have, the longer you have to W-A-I-T for everything. The more you have to W A I T. So there, this is how our relationship with time is created, because these are all enterprises that you are waiting for. And once, when you get an inspiration, you think, "What should I do now?" And and you get this thought: "You should, you should move here, or you should do this, or you should take this job, or you should work with this person." You will always, always first check with all your anchors. Well, if I do this, what will that mean 
for my capacity to maintain this anchor, that anchor, this one, and this one. You will first check with all your anchors before you check with your interior heart and guidance and soul that says, should I do this? And, if, and then you'll do your calculation. If you have 10 anchors, you'll have to factor in 10 delays. And you'll say, well, I can't, I can't do that yet, maybe five years from now. That's how time's created. Whereas if you are anchorless, you'll think, oh yeah, I'm free to do that now and watch the laws of cooperation start. Watch that synchronicity. And then you'll say to me, and you'll, it's the damnedest thing. And I was down the street and I just met this person that did did, 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 because you're in the here and now. Even Jesus said, let the dead go. Get yourself here. Buddha, everything right now, everything is in the here and now. And your vocabulary will accommodate that. This is how it works. This is how healing works. This is how your body works. This is how creation works. This is how the laws work. We are creatures of law. There. So I feel like if, if we have these anchors, they're mostly created through negative words and negative thinking. So yeah. then, and it, and uh, illusion. Illusions. So then if we look at something that feels like that you can feel where the anchors are coming from in the past, then maybe reframing it as though writing a story, looking at the magical parts of it. Um, do you feel that, do you think that would be a way of releasing the anchors? So oh, would yeah. Oh, be oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my dear, my dear, my dear. Absolutely. Where's my story? Maybe I'll, I'll read it next week. I was going to save it for next week. But I, I just have the most delicious. Uh, uh, I just, I'm going to save it for next week, but I just, to, I was going to end next week with it. Yes, I will end it. But yes, absolutely. You have to write things about, you have to just write it in the most absurd, switch the facts. Switch the switch the facts. Put a teacup on someone's head. Okay. You're gonna you. you're, you're gonna create a tea party next week. Who you want there? Who do you want at your tea party? <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna actually you're gonna sit there with the Cheshire cat and two of the guests. You're gonna have an absurd tea party. What do you want to say to them at the tea party? You're gonna dress them like you like the Mad Hatter. <laughs> And actually, the Mad Hatter was a character Dante had in hell. I mean, a Hatter. I mean, you, 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 the absurdity, absurdity changes everything. It's power. It's not absurdity. It's the use of imagination like a silver bullet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. More before we leave, uh, Paolo. Please. Yeah. So um, thank you, Caroline. I was really touched by your lecture and feel like I would love rereading the book and process inside out as I will cherish, cherish your lecture as well. There's something powerful about um, what you said about the, our ability to use words. Um, and that seems to pertain only to human and actually uh, at least not animals and vegetal, vegetals um, for sure they have their own powers. But that's the power to shape our thoughts and manifest our life. It made me make the connection with uh, the free will, the liberum arbitrium. So our ability to choose, and by choosing our words, we choose the perspectives, and through that, we shape our realities. So, so that was really uh, deep, and, and thanks for that. And since there's something also about the fifth chakra, uh, that I not know how to put into words now, but about, about our ability to express our truth and ourselves by choosing also our words. But I'll have to explore that, um, so not able now to comment that one. And last but not least, I love your exercise about thinking about six impossible things. Yes. And, and opening the magic and accept miracles in life. So thank you. Deeply. And I want you all to do that exercise, please. You need to do six impossible things before breakfast. <laughs> well, thank you, Carolyn. And uh, Georg, what is the date 
of the December uh, lecture. Georgie, do you know just so everybody has it? Yes, it's already uh, when you registered for the Zoom webinar, uh, it was changed in that um, on that website. Let me just pick it up again. Uh, what date it actually is? I think it's the 12th. It, yeah, that's correct. It's the 13th, Friday the 13th. The Friday the 13th, that's it. That's Friday, it. The Friday the 13th. Yes. So everyone will meet again on Friday the 13th. I want to just close this out with one additional thought that I think would be good to hold in the mind as you think of these six impossible things before <laughs> breakfast. And that is that Ray Moody, who Carolyn knows very well and, and a number of us who's been studying the phenomenon of death, you know, he's one of the great Thanatos uh, 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 focalizers. And as he's been studying after death experiences, near death experiences, uh, relatives who go down the death passage um, to a certain oh. point and are stopped. I mean, Ray Moody has, has seen it all around this ultimate mystery of death. And as Carolyn knows, over the last 10 years or so, uh, more and more Ray uh, Moody has been concentrating on literature like Alice in Wonderland. I didn't know that. Nonsense sense. Um, as the way to enter into the experience by freeing the mind of the logic that chains us to the past. Uh, and so uh, several courses that he has been um, providing for us over the last number of years have been infused with this nonsense literature as a gateway to the ultimate mystery. So what Carolyn's talking about in terms of our ordinary lives is also something um, very profound as we look to the ultimate and great transition which takes us into uh, the beyond. So Alice in Wonderland is not just another children's book of fantasy. It's a deep work of philosophy and theology and psychology that has implications for many layers of our existence and future states of being. So Carolyn, I really want to thank you for opening this subject up for us and I look forward to our continuation and conclusion on the 13th, Friday the 13th. I know. Uh, and I want to tell you something. That, that it, speaking of Thanatology, Ray Moody's other partner in that is Ken Ring. I, I think you might know Ken's work in Death and okay. Dying and that's his birthday. Ooh. December, Even better, everyone. <laughs> and I, I'm still very close to him. Yeah. And, and um, you know, we were once engaged, Ken and I. And oh. I used to have parties where I was the only one who hadn't died. <laughs> <laughs> so, everyone, so, your homework is six impossibilities before breakfast. <laughs> impossible things. Six impossible things. And, and, and just make sure you do that. That's a lot of impossibilities. So, thank, <laughs> thank you, everybody. You, it's been so much thank you, fun. Thank you, Carolyn. Very much. Bye-bye. Happy Thanksgiving, all. <laughs>